Welcome, everybody. Happy Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, as you settle in, grab your coffee, find a nice quiet spot to enjoy our webinar today and let us know where you're coming from. Welcome from New Mexico. So excited to have you here from Calgary. Welcome everybody. We are going to be talking about how to teach children to embrace differences very important topic and I'm so excited to dive into this today with you. We have an absolutely amazing guest and presentation ready for you today. Welcome everybody. Happy Thursday. Welcome from Toronto. It is a gloomy day here in Toronto. It has been raining non-stop. I don't know about anybody else but I actually love a rainy day. Waking up to the rain actually is probably one of my favorite things so I don't hate it today. Welcome everybody. Happy Thursday. As always, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy, busy days to be here, to learn, to grow, to, to focus on how to teach children to embrace differences. I appreciate all of you for taking the time to be here today. Welcome. As you settle in, of course, let us know where you're coming from. We'd love to see where everybody is joining from. Welcome everybody, happy Thursday, my favorite afternoon of the week. We have a fabulous webinar for you today. It is already two o'clock. I know we only got about a minute or two of some peaceful music to calm us down before the webinar today, but we are gonna dive right in today because I absolutely wanna make sure that we can leverage our entire hour together that we have. Again, welcome to How to Teach Children to Embrace Differences. Super excited for today's webinar. Before we get started, I just want to do a quick call out about our 2021 Early Childhood Educator of the Year. We have received hundreds of nominations for our Early Childhood Educator of the Year, and now is the time to vote for who you think should win Early Childhood Educator of the Year. Morgan is posting a link in the chat, so please be sure to follow that link. Take a look at who was nominated for Early Childhood Educator of the Year and cast your vote. It will be open until February 28th, so definitely pop in there, share it with your community, and then, very exciting, we will announce the winner live in the March 3rd webinar, so I hope you can be here for that. Oh, oops, I clicked the link for us. We don't want to go to it just yet. Um, my mistake. Let's get back to it. In terms of lesson planning, I know lesson planning and curriculum development is often hard to find the time. So if you do need help, please be sure to sign up for our Hi Mama activities. You can receive activities straight to your inbox. Um, we have 200 plus activities in there for you right now. You can filter by domain by age, by theme, and you can even save the ones that are your favorite. So definitely pop in there. Morgan will post a link for you to sign up to our Hi Mama activities. In terms of a disclaimer, if this is the first time you are joining our webinar, we just like to send a reminder that this content is not personalized legal or financial advice for your center. The goal today is for us to get together as a community of early childhood educators and to give you tips, tricks, and techniques for your center, for your classrooms, for your homes. Um, but if you are looking at making any big changes at your center, we just wanna make sure that you are consulting the right people when you make those decisions. We are going to give a quick listen to our land acknowledgement now. Hi Mama acknowledges that our main headquarters is situated in Toronto, Ontario on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Toronto itself is a word that originates from the Mohawk word Takaranto, meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing. As participants and guests in today's webinars, we are coming together from many different places around the world. We encourage you to learn about and acknowledge the land from which you participate. And we're now going to give a listen to our diversity and inclusion statement. Hi Mama is committed to fostering an inclusive 
and welcoming environment for our employees, customers, and community. Hi Mama welcomes and celebrates individuals of all backgrounds, orientations, and identities. Our Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee aims to ensure we provide a safe environment for everyone to thrive while bringing their authentic selves to work. Our mission is to promote an inclusive workspace for all employees through education, discussion, and celebration of our differences. Embracing these differences while coming together with a common purpose is what makes our team extra special. Okay, and some housekeeping pieces before we dive in. A reminder, this session is being recorded. Okay, so if anything comes up and you do have to pop off, not to worry, you will receive um, a show notes email with the slides and the recording by early next week. If you do require the closed captions, please be sure to hit that CC tab on your Zoom and also know that we are recording with the closed captions enabled as well. In terms of the certificate, for everyone who is joining our live webinar today, you will absolutely receive a certificate of participation for being here today. Please know it does take a couple of days to get the certificates fully out. So if you do not see your certificate today or even tomorrow, do not worry. You will receive your certificate by early next week. And lastly, if you're having any issues at all, I certainly hope you're not, but please be sure if you're having issues with your Zoom that you're consulting support.zoom.us, they will be able to help you. And in terms of Hi Mama, if you have never heard of us before, welcome. I'm so glad you found us. If this is your first webinar with us, let us know in the chat. I love to see all the new members of our Hi Mama Helps webinar community that have found their way to our amazing webinars. On top of our fabulous community of professional development of webinars and podcasts, we are also the number one rated child care management app. If you did not know, we provide an app for child care centers to improve their parent communication. You can do your photo and video sharing, contactless billing, automatically create child portfolios, and lots more. So if you are interested in learning more, we would love to show you around our Hi Mama app. Morgan will post a link in the chat so you can learn more. And just know if you do sign up for Hi Mama, or maybe you are already a part of our Hi Mama family, if you didn't know, on top of our webinars, we have weekly podcasts that are hosted with the CEO of Hi Mama. So I definitely recommend taking a listen to those if you haven't already. Again, we have hundreds of free activities to support you in your classrooms. You can send them to parents to do at home. We have tons of articles by industry experts that are being released. And know you will receive world-class support. I used to work on our support team here at Hi Mama as well, and I can absolutely say it is a fabulous group of humans who are waiting to support you and help you make this change at your center. And lastly, know that we are a B certified company. And what this means that as we work with our fabulous customers, we are also actively making a positive impact in the early childhood education space. And finally, your host, if this is your first webinar, again, my name is Maddie. I am your host of our Hi Mama Helps webinars. I'm also a customer advocacy specialist here at Hi Mama and one of the early childhood educators that we have here on our team. Today, we have my lovely co-host, Morgan, who is joining us. Morgan, pop on. You want to share a fun fact of something going on with you today? Nothing's going on with me today, but I, <laughs> it's very rainy here. So I am hoping that this weekend, we have a long weekend, so I'm hoping that mm. it's a bit sunny and I can maybe get outside a little bit. So that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Absolutely. Forgot we have a long weekend coming up. If you have a long weekend coming up as well, let us know what you're getting up to this weekend. I hope we do get some sun. All right, and finally, last but absolutely not least, our special guest today, we have Dr. Donna Hausman and Emily Stone. Donna, why don't you pop on? Welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Donna, to make sure you get your full time, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn my mic off, my camera off, and the stage is all yours. Thank you so much for being here, Donna. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here with you all. Um, I'm really excited about this afternoon and being able to have the opportunity to talk with everybody about how to help children begin to understand and celebrate differences with empathy. We'll be addressing several issues. How do we lay the foundation so children have the ability to accept, appreciate, 
and embrace diversity throughout their lives, which is so fundamental today in our global society. And what your key role is as an educator in helping to model and guide their understanding and their development of the big world of differences. And when is the opportune time to begin addressing differences with children? And is it ever too young? When we're talking about differences, what does that really mean? Well, difference means something is unlike something else in some way. There are differences within us, between us, and among us. So when we're thinking about differences within us, we're looking at individual differences, which can include physical characteristics, cognitive abilities, personality, and character traits to differences between us, which can involve ideas, religions, beliefs, and among us, involving gender, race, ethnicity, culture. Difference is the lifeblood of many good and positive things, such as competition, progress, choice, and innovation. However, when sameness is emphasized over difference, all these things suffer as a consequence. It's important to note the formation of bias, an unfair tendency to believe that some people, cultures, perspectives are better than others, is not ingrained nor is the understanding of difference. Both need to be taught to take root and develop. So how does this happen? And when is the most opportune time to introduce children to how to view themselves, their friends across their play space and the world around them? Too often we assume that children know difference from the start, the differences between red and blue, cats and dogs, However, children are not born understanding differences, but they are born with the propensity to develop that understanding. Think about it. An infant doesn't know from day one that there is a difference between a dog and a cat, but over time, they'll learn this difference. They'll have books read to them that shows this is a dog, this is a cat, and they'll interact with these animals directly and take notice of the way they move and the sounds they make. Children are naturally curious as we know, and as they become aware of even the smallest of differences, such as hair color, eye color, body shape, they may look at themselves and say, this isn't how I look. And although all children are born ready with their first language being that of emotion, with an insatiable curiosity and sense of wonder, oftentimes we make the assumption that understanding differences is ingrained. While children begin to notice and question everything from the start, children have not yet formed their understanding and critical judgment of differences. So when is that opportune time to start to introduce and teach children to understand and embrace difference with empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another? We really need to start early on from birth. This is the time we can begin to explore understanding differences and celebrate diversity and begin to help children identify and understand what their friend across their play space is feeling. Why? Well, because universally children are born ready to learn with emotions as their first language. Starting from infancy, we have a window of opportunity to help children build awareness, understanding, and acceptance, allowing them to embrace differences and build empathy, caring, and kindness. By promoting these vitally important capacities and abilities, they will become part of the child's character and moral development for the rest of their lives. So how does this really happen? From birth, children's brains are developing very rapidly. They are born with 100 million new neural connections forming every second. Think about that. There's a wealth of wiring in building the brain's architecture. And before children reach pre-K, 90% of the brain has been developed and you're involved in this. This is the time to start to lay the foundation for healthy brain development, a positive sense of self, and understanding of the other and the world around them. It's time to promote and foster their ability to think, learn, reason, and succeed. 
providing the foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. Let's just take a moment to understand this rapidly developing brain. Brain function, if we think about it, is the interaction between genetics and experience. And from birth, it's the context, the environment and the presence or absence of experiences with responsive relationships that determine what genetics get expressed and what neurons get activated, contributing and leading to who we become and how we learn to deal with and manage our own emotions, our thinking, and our behavior. And another word that we can use to describe that is developing self-regulation. Children learn and internalize these experiences through observation and imitation and how we guide, direct, and respond to them and to others through our own actions and our reactions, our attitudes, <clears throat> our language, our behavior, and our emotions. And let's remember that emotion is the first language of every child. As a matter of fact, our emotions are the key connector in what unites us all. We all feel happiness, anger, sadness, fear, excitement. And though we may think differently or look differently, how we feel when mommy or daddy drop us off at school or when our pet is sick or we can't go out to play on the playground, are all experiences with shared emotions that children encounter. Feeling sad when their parent leaves, when their pet gets sick, or angry if they can't go out to play or misplacing their lobby. By starting from the earliest age, we can show children that yes, everyone is different in some way, and difference is a part of life and living. Everyone has something that matters and makes them unique and special be it skin color, hair texture, body shape, gender, religious beliefs, ethnic background, we all have something that is different within families, between one another and within oneself that create different causes for our feelings based on our different experiences. The common thread that binds and unites us together is that of our emotions. It is learning how to understand and manage our own emotions and those of others that underscores and contributes to our ability to accept and embrace difference with, with empathy. So how do we help children know what to do with all their big emotions? And this starts with emotional intelligence. And when we're talking about our emotions, it's important to keep in mind, we're really talking about our mental health. Emotional intelligence is having the skills to understand, manage, and regulate our emotions and understand the emotions of others. It's critical in building healthy relationships, resolving conflict, developing empathy, and the ability for appreciation and acceptance of differences and the experiences of others. As shared earlier, children are born with emotion as their first language universally and they are by nature emotional detectives. Continually observing, reading, and absorbing the emotions, actions, and reactions of the key adults in their world, both good and not so good, be it picking up the adult's anxiety or pride, children take it all in. So what is the critical role that key adults in their world have in their emotional development, perspectives, and development of empathy? and how vital are supportive, responsive relationships. Well, children are sponges, as we know, and they pick up on all adult reactions and actions towards others through verbal and physical cues and by watching everyday behaviors and interactions. We know from research that children are not pre-wired with bias, but rather they acquire their understanding and develop any biases of societal groups involving gender, race, ethnicity, or language, or body shape by observing the key trusted adults in their world. When a child sees an adult they trust showing bias in favor of or against another person, that child will learn to behave in the same manner. Even the smallest cues, such as a tone of voice, body language, opinions, attitudes, beliefs, judgments, and interactions with and towards others will be picked up, remembered, and replicated. 
It's because of this that it is so critical for educators and significant caregivers to be self-aware of their own biases and put into work the work that is required in terms of helping themselves be more aware of what their biases may be. And this all starts with you. It becomes the critical job of educators and caregivers to help children understand that noticing similarities and differences is normal, and then to openly discuss differences in a way that promotes acceptance rather than judgment or fear or dislike or even hate. Children must be and can be taught that differences are something to be understood, embraced, and celebrated, not something to fear, mock, or run away from. This starts with an awareness and an understanding of one's own emotions and those of others, one's emotional competence or emotional intelligence. Being able to recognize and identify, understand and express and manage one's own emotions and those of others in constructive ways. This is how children from birth are internalizing this information from how we direct, model, guide and respond to them. How we lead through example informs their understanding and their attitudes. But first, to be effective and successful, the adult has to be aware of their own attitudes, beliefs, and their emotions. It's important to be aware that your attitudes and emotions and behaviors and nonverbal body language heavily impact how a children learns and develops. They hear our words, our tone of voice, they watch our actions, and they pick up on our feelings. These words, actions, and emotions in turn shape how children view themselves, how they view others, and how they experience differences, and how they interact with the community as they grow and develop. When a child observes or senses and that the adults in their world avoid or are uncomfortable around others who do not look like them, live near them, or even speak the same language as them, children pick up on these cues and they become the basis of their knowledge of others and inform how they act toward and interact with those who are not receiving acceptance from adults. Before we can help our child, children build their own emotional and social muscles around diversity, we must first look at our own. How do we respond? What does our circle times look like? What is our attitude? And how do we express that attitude? It starts with self-awareness and being open and honest and recognizing the messaging we are sharing with our children so that you can best recognize and help children with their emotions and create a safe and welcoming classroom where every child's emotions and experiences matter, are heard, and are validated. So how do we do this? <clears throat> well, you can begin by explaining to young children what differences are and how each person is unique in so many ways. So for example, with infants, we point out and discuss differences starting with colors. So if children are together and you know, you may point out that Johnny has a blue shirt on and Susie has a red shirt on, and we can talk about colors of clothing that the children are wearing, the color of their hair, the color of their skin, and really be able to help children begin to see that you know, in feeling sad when mommy and daddy have left, but they also share that together, even though they may be looking different, wearing different colors and having different color hair, skin, so forth. With toddlers and with preschoolers, we start by explaining the differences between something that the child knows, such as differences within and between, for example, groups of pets cats, dogs, birds. And we know that there are differences between these groups, but there are also differences again within the groups, all different kinds of dogs and different kinds of cats and different kinds of birds. Also, if we think about transportation, cars, buses, trucks, or a box of crayon, we're asking the child, what if all the crayons were the same color? And discuss how different colors 
make drawing much more fun, much more interesting and unique. This concept can be related to people as well. Everyone is different and these differences should be celebrated. Inclusion of diver diverse materials from different cultures in terms of foods or dolls or, or pictures, all are important in creating an inclusive environment. So what else can we do as educators and caregivers to help children continue to learn about and celebrate differences with empathy as they grow and they develop? Taking down walls and building bridges of awareness and understanding by modeling behaviors and attitudes and discussing differences openly to promote conversations about differences in race, ethnicity, religion, abilities, physical appearances, families' backgrounds, providing examples of how to be inclusive when interacting with others, talking about your own differences. You can explain differences in your family's culture, physical features, personality, and experiences, and relate them to how wonderful it is to be different and unique. Those differences are what makes you, you. By listening and responding appropriately to children's questions about differences in a way that models effective communication, openness, and acceptance, rather than judgment towards others. Children are curious and navigate the world by asking lots of questions and learning from your responses to those questions. If a child has a question about why a person is in a wheelchair, explain that they need the wheelchair because a certain part of their body might not work. But it is also important to emphasize things that this person can do well, all while teaching the importance of kindness, compassion, and care for others. By exposing children to different cultures and, tra and traditions, participate in cultural celebrations, particularly those that differ from your own. See how they celebrate special occasions and the foods that they eat. Children are, um, share activities where they can explore, learn about, and meet people of different backgrounds and experiences. Read books that celebrate diversity. Having books that celebrate differences and include people from diverse backgrounds and cultures are important to have on your bookshelf. Look for Caldecott Award books that represent diversity each year. This helps expose children to individuals who look differently, think differently, and live differently. Exploring, talking about, and celebrating these differences helps us all acknowledge and accept them as part of our lives. By addressing unaccepting language and behavior, children often have questions when it comes to differences and diversity. Help correct biases that children may have by discussing, asking questions, answering questions, and providing opportunities for children to share their thinking as a way of reshaping to one of acceptance. Asking questions such as, what was it about that person that made you feel that way? And following up with a discussion to provide explanations and reasons to correct unjust assumptions about differences. All of this needs to happen within an environment where children feel safe and secure through the experience of being understood, known and accepted in a safe place where they can express, experience, and experience and be who they are. Children need safe and embracing classroom experiences where every child has a voice and their experiences and emotions matter, are heard, respected, and validated. Who helps them? Empathic educators. They have an impact in shaping learning environments for a more inclusive classroom community. Important to create learning spaces where sharing our own experiences and learning about and listening to other experiences is encouraged. You may not always like the same things, dress the same way, eat the same foods, speak the same language, or identify the same way as everyone around you. In fact, that's a good thing. How exciting it is to be consistently learning and discovering new things. 
critical to creating learning environments with a variety of diverse materials that support children's develop of their own emotional competencies, foster their emotional, cognitive, and social worlds, and help children to share their feelings and their experiences, perspectives, and learn from those of others. Learning environments and teachers' role in promoting children's play help celebrate all children's ideas, thoughts, experiences, and values, allowing them again to feel heard and seen despite their differences while building a more inclusive classroom community. So how do we make this all happen? Through training and support. Educators need training, resources, tools, and support, not only to be able to be effectively building children's emotional competence, their self-regulation and empathy, but also to develop their own emotionality and empathic understanding. And why is training so key? Being able to understand and express your own emotions and attitudes and opinions in a healthy way is not easy for anyone. With comprehensive training and support in becoming emotionally intelligent, teachers are better able to model and guide and empathically respond to the many needs, emotions, and experiences of all the children and families who they work with. When, a when children learn the skills of emotional intelligence, they become more aware and sensitive to their own emotions and experiences, as well as to those of others. They learn this from us. Our Begin to Excel training is designed to teach and guide children and educators alike. Begin to Excel educators uncover moments when children demonstrate empathy and turn them into learning opportunities about themselves, their friends across their play space, and the world around them. Through training, educators develop the skills to demonstrate empathy through modeling and in teaching by example for how children can sensitively and empathically respond to and understand the emotions and experiences of others. And when we have the skills to help children understand, manage, and regulate their own emotions and those of others and turn them into teaching and learning opportunities, we are providing them with a foundation for positive sense of self, mental health, and well being. They will have the toolkit to carry with them throughout their lives, setting them on the best path possible, closing gaps and opening doors to opportunity. To successfully do this, again, we really want to focus on the importance of training and support being so essential. Educators need to have the skills to understand, manage, and regulate their own emotions before they can model and guide the children in their own emotional growth. And right now, I am delighted and pleased to introduce Emily Stone, who has gone through our Begin to Excel training and can share her own insights and classroom experiences on how important training has been in her work. And we are going to engage in a, in a conversation um, and Emily is going to have the opportunity to share again, her experiences and tips in terms of what has worked best, both as a teacher, but also as a trainer. So Emily, thrilled to have us both here together. Yes, and you're glad to be here. So why don't we begin by, if you can talk a little bit about how you create a safe and, ac and accepting learning environment for children and providing the opportunities for all children to share their personal experiences and learn from others. Absolutely. I really think that when you are in a classroom, creating those safe learning environments um, where the classroom in general and all those who inhabit it are um, accepting and willing to learn from others. Um, so the first step in that really is to expose children to a diverse variety of materials, whether that be, um, you know, different dramatic play foods from around the world or books containing diverse topics, 
dolls that represent different cultures. It's so critical to broaden their worldview in this way um, by incorporating diverse materials into the learning environment that really help children with imagination and creativity. And again, expanding that worldview, which for children is very narrow. Um, they're used to what they're used to. Um, in terms of just the general classroom environment as well, it's our job as educators to really reassure and validate children's individual experiences, their opinions, ideas, feelings, and differences, um, and being really open to discussing differences so that children can feel safe and comfortable in also discussing and learning differences of others as well as in themselves. Um, so really incorporating learning about differences and celebrating differences into all moments of the classroom, whether in learning spaces, in daily routines or curriculum, can really help to strengthen that human-to-human -human connection and really help children be accepting and open to not only sharing their differences, but learning from those of others. Right, and, and it's really helpful for us to remember too, that differences exist within families and within oneself. Absolutely. And being able to point that out to all children is a nice segue into talking about differences between one another and people that are outside of our families and in different cultures and things of that sort. I agree. And, you know, another part to creating safe environments as well is really including families into that. Okay. Um, I would, you know, really focus on family engagement and actually bringing families in to sharing their differences, whether that's, you know, their family traditions or their cultural traditions and helping, you know, families get involved in teaching about themselves and what is unique to them and also learning from those of others. And that does you know, all in all, create a more inclusive learning community, not just in the classroom, but in the school as a whole. That was one of the favorite things we did at our lab school. We would yeah. have an evening because we had children from all over the world and we would have an evening where the families would come in and they would be dressed in, in clothing that really represented their traditions and their cultures. They would be making foods uh, and really talking a lot about how they celebrated certain holidays and the children and families loved it. Absolutely. Yeah, I actually did an entire curriculum unit on culture specific to the children in my class and asked families if they were comfortable to come in and share and teach a lesson about something that was specific to them. So we had families come in and teach how to write calligraphy in their language or show, you know, traditional cultural clothing that um, they can show with others and really helping to engage the entire community as you're pointing out. Absolutely. Okay, so now how do you promote an understanding in children that everyone has feelings, but may react to situations differently based on their personal experiences? Sure. You know, I think it's worth pointing out that when children feel safe and able to really share and explore the differences in themselves and in others, they do gain an understanding that everyone is unique, everyone is different, um, and everyone has different experiences that do cause different feelings. So it's really important to build the connection between children's emotions and their personal experiences specific to what they've experienced in life um, and their own differences. So really focusing on causes for different emotions related to experiences, both at home and at school, and really supporting children and understanding that feelings, while we all have them and we all have the same many feelings, they may look different for each of us based on our experience. They may have different causes based on our experience um, and that they don't all look the same, but that's why it's all the more important to act with empathy towards others. Um, so when, you know, children discuss and learn those differences, they do start to become more empathetic and accepting and inclusive. And as you pointed out during your presentation, that does all start with the educator modeling for children and teaching the children those skills and really setting that precedent and making those connections in the classroom. And I think what's also important to add to this is, yes, educators are extremely important, particularly having the influence in helping to inform and shape the beginning of a child's character and, and, and development. Uh, but equally important is communicating with the families, with the parents, so that the messaging that is happening within the school can also be brought back home. And parents can be learning ways um, to be able to really incorporate this messaging uh, within their own families and support what the children are learning at school. And that connection is so important for a child. 
Definitely. And that's something too, that can be really incorporated into teachers daily communication practices with families. So whether that's through the Hi Mama app or through a daily email, being able to share what the class has explored and learned today and incorporate some of that language for celebrating and learning about differences and acceptance and emotions to try to help families in incorporating the same techniques at home to provide that consistency. And what we found too is that families are hungry for this. They don't also, they don't often make, you know, ask about it, but when it is offered and provided, they are so hungry and they so welcome to learn along with their children. Absolutely. I always point out as well that oftentimes it's the parents coming to me as an educator because they've seen a difference in their child at home. So whether their child will come home sharing something exciting from school or using language that we use at, at school to really support differences and um, empathy. And then the parents will come to us and say, you know, tell me more about this. What strategies can I use for, um, at home? And that really does help to bridge the gap between home and school and ultimately provide the best support for the child um, in terms of consistency. Absolutely. Okay, so how would you handle a situation if a child in your class makes fun of another child for being different? That's a great question. Um, I think the first step is really addressing that behavior and turning it into a learning opportunity for all children involved. Um, children are naturally curious. You pointed out earlier that they're emotional detectives. So oftentimes when there is this type of a social problem that arises between children, there are onlookers and observers. And so it's so critical to really handle that situation appropriately and turn it into that learning opportunity, as I mentioned. Um, so I think it's it's really important to really start by asking, you know, what would you feel if someone made fun of you for the way that you look or the language you speak or where you come from? Um, and then explaining that when someone makes fun of me for being different, it hurts my feelings. Uh, I think it's also really key to, you know, help the child understand that if you have questions about a friend who's different or another person who's different, which are natural for young children who are so curious, that you can ask them about it or ask a teacher in a way that doesn't hurt their feelings. Um, all while emphasizing, of course, that being different is, again, a good thing and that we can learn from each other's differences rather than making fun of them. Um, it's also really helpful to point out smaller differences just between individuals involved. I would do this as myself as a teacher by pointing out what is different about myself than you um, and kind of help bridge the gap from, you know, what, again, what would you feel if you were made fun of for that difference? Right. And encouraging conversation about it. Oftentimes people just shove it under the carpet. You know, somebody said something that yeah. was hurtful, whatever, and they ignore it. But it's so important to bring it to the surface and in appropriate conversation and communication that there are ways to really talk about it without being critical or judgmental, but really curious and informative and being able to fill in the blanks that are left open to be able to help the child begin to understand about this. Absolutely. And again, the best way to really do that is by being open to responding to questions. I think, as you mentioned previously, our, our biases and our judgments are learned behaviors from you know, others in our lives and others around us. And so it's important as a, for us as educators to really be able to respond to those questions appropriately and try to rework some of that learned bias and judgment um, moving towards acceptance. Exactly. Okay, so now how has your training impacted the way you approach empathy, both in yourself and supporting children to develop empathy, inclusivity, and pro-social behaviors? I think, you know, the first step to my training um, through Begin to Excel was really being open to growth first and foremost. And the first step to that was really self-reflecting and building self-awareness. Um, as I just mentioned, bias and prejudice is taught. It's not predetermined. Um, so that really does make self-awareness as an educator all the more important. Um, during your presentation, you, you pointed out how teachers are the models and guides for children who are learning that same behavior. And so for educators, it's really critical to self-reflect on your potential learned biases, which can be very uncomfortable and not easy, um, but is, is really necessary to having those uncomfortable conversations and putting in the work to being more accepting in this society. Uh, because ultimately when you do put in that work, children then pick up on that um, and become more accepting individuals instead of internalizing that bias. 
Um, so it's just as important for educators to learn as it is for children to learn. And we can't really expect children to be empathetic and accepting and inclusive if we aren't doing the same ourselves, both as parents, educators, school administration teams. It's so critical that the work starts with us. Right, and, and self-reflection is critical across many areas. Um, and being able to allow ourselves to start to reflect about you know, our own teachings and our own experiences and some we wanna hold on to, some we don't wanna hold on to, we wanna help change. And the only way that change is going to happen is through becoming aware of ourselves and, and how we can then best become involved in, in making those changes. Definitely. And then when you do do that and you put in that work, you're then able to really turn your classroom and your school community into a place where you're teaching children empathy and inclusivity and pro-social behaviors and these skills really that are so necessary in life and in our society um, today and always. Um, and really making discussions and empathy, inclusivity, and pro-social behavior an all-day, everyday occurrence in the classroom, um, which can be done in so many ways, even from, you know, the smallest ways of just acknowledging and praising acts of empathy and pro-social behavior out loud in front of others, um, you know, guiding children to really think about how others feel and what they may have experienced but also to guide children in understanding how their words and actions and behaviors impact other people. Um, you know, I think one thing that you said in your presentation as well is, while we may not be able to fully understand another person's experiences because we haven't gone through them ourselves, we can still really listen and learn from them and direct that information inwards to really change how we navigate others and our world with empathy and acceptance. Um, and so for children, that really does need to be taught and included in a focus of, uh, of the classroom learning environment. Right, and addressed. And, and what is Absolutely. so important in addressing it is when it's not addressed, it can invariably lead in some instances to bullying. And that's not something yeah. you want to encourage or support. So being able to do this can avert and avoid those kinds of situations from happening. And when we learn how to listen to ourselves in terms of self-reflection, we're also learning how to listen better, not only to the children, but to the parents, the families that we're working with as well, and our co-teachers. Yes. So that 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 experience and that and that ability to really be aware and reflect is so vital again not just to oneself but to your relating and your relationships as well absolutely i did see in the chat box that we have about five minutes left so i actually wanted to ask a question to the chat box and attendees and hear your responses as well um, so I'm curious about what strategies you use either as teachers or as administration teams in schools to support children and educators in learning and teaching about differences, um, whether in the classroom or in the larger school community, because it is so critical and it's great to be able to share these strategies and learn from others to be able to really apply them into our school centers. Exactly. We can just monitor the chat box, but we have a few more minutes left. So if anyone has anything. So I see unconditional positive regard as a strategy for the classroom, mm -hmm. which is great. Addressing the issues again, rather than ignoring the differences, which is so critical as we've also discussed. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are absolutely great strategies. Listening and validating feelings. And yes, not shying away from uncomfortable conversations with, with children, I think is, is very important as well. That is so important. And remember, it's never too young to start introducing this. And although sometimes people kind of look at me when I say from birth, it is so important because children, even though they can't talk yet, they're receiving information mm -hmm. in terms of receptive language and they're learning. So it is really important to start when, again, the brain is so very plastic and developing so rapidly that it's setting the patterning in the brain for life. So we want to really get in there early. Absolutely. And yeah. also picking up on our body language and communications, they uh -huh. are able to observe if they, even if they cannot communicate. That's right. Exactly. Well, 
I want to thank you all, you know, for joining us. This is a really important conversation. Um, and I look forward to hearing more, you know, responses from you um, in the chat box. And if you would like to learn any further information about us, you know, I welcome you to visit our website at hausmaninstitute.com. And this has been a wonderful pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Donna and Emily. That was absolutely fabulous. We do have a couple of questions um, that I'd love to get to in a couple of minutes. Um, I will let you both just take a sip of water, catch your breath for a second. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And uh, what we're going to do just really quickly before we dive into some questions is for our audience here, it is time for our question of the day. And we would love to hear from you. How do you currently track children's emotional development at your center? So how are you tracking to have those conversations with family about empathy development, about positive social emotional development at your center? And let us know if you are interesting, interested in learning how the HIMAM app can help make it easier to track emotional development. Um, in Hi Mama, when you are doing that documentation, whether throughout the day or at the end of the day, you can easily attach the emotional skills the child is working on and is developing. And then that automatically goes into um, charts for you to share with the family. So you can continuously monitor that child's learning journey. So take a second and answer that poll there. Let us know what you are doing. Are you doing paper documentation online? Or are you using a child care app? And let us know if you're interested in learning a bit more about how we might be able to help you at your center. I am now going to pop right back over to our special guest Q&A. Um, so we did have a few questions come in. So I'm excited to kind of chat with you both for a couple of minutes here before we wrap up. Now, I don't know if you were able to see much of the chat throughout. I know it's really hard to monitor, but one of the top things I saw coming in is the importance of parent involvement in helping children <clears throat> um, to understand diversity and differences in empathy. Now, how have you, if you've ever had to handle a situation in which parents are perhaps instilling biases in their children that are not accepted in your classroom? That's a great question and a really difficult situation to navigate. I think, you know, at the end of the day, it isn't necessarily, you know, in terms of adjusting a parent's biases, that's a, a little bit more challenging to do because, again, the parents learned those behaviors as a child themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but what you can do is, again, really work to ask the child questions about why, you know, what is it that made you feel that way or think that way? ask if the child has any questions that you can answer and in your responses and actions and attitudes to those to those questions being able to answer op honestly and openly and in a way that promotes acceptance and empathy um, and celebrating differences and really trying to rework that thought process uh, but that definitely I mean that definitely is a very challenging situation to navigate and one that is definitely prevalent in the field. Right. I, I think one of the other things, in addition to what Emily is pointing out that's so important, is that when you're working with the, the child, as Emily was just pointing out, it's important to be able to address those kinds of situations. But also when you're talking with a parent, to be able to help the parent understand that, you know, it's important to help children understand that there are differences within oneself, that there are differences within a family, and that it's important to be able to recognize and celebrate that, and that not everybody is the same. And we're extending it, you know, to people outside of the family because in a school situation, we're all being brought together. And it's important to be able to, you know, be able to share and, and get along and, and celebrate one another. And so those are ways to kind of gently enter into the conversation with a parent, and then listen to see what they are responding back to you in terms of how much further you may want to go or not. Yeah, I think also when, you know, if I'll use the example of bullying that brought, uh, was brought up previously that, 
if something like that does happen in the classroom, parent communication either way is key. So it is important to consistently be keeping parents updated on children's behavior just as we normally would. Mm -hmm. And making fun of another person for being different is part of that behavior. And so I think approaching that type of communication and really being you know, upfront with parents of this is what happened today. This is how I handled it and approached it using this language. And this is what I saw as a result um, can also help scaffold that language and thought process for parents without being so direct about, you know, the change that you want to see. Absolutely. And, and you both kind of also dived into my second question, actually, which was, you know, this, this isn't a learning that really is supposed to stop at the door at the end of the day when the child yeah. is being picked up. So whether the parent is in agreement or, or not, what are your kind of best practices for helping to continue that learning outside of the classroom and in their, their homes, maybe even in their grandparents' homes and all these other environments that they're going to? Again, it's communicating with the families on a regular basis, on a daily basis, in terms of, you know, what children may be learning, or as Emily pointed out, what they may be struggling with, or having a challenge, you know, with in terms of being able to help the parent, again, be part of the solution, be be participating. I think that the more we can include parents in the process in terms of not only informing them about what is happening, but in inviting them in terms of what some of their thinking may be is, is really important in, in developing and generating a partnership between yourself as the educator and the parent. And the more we can really develop those partnerships, the more certain things start to really unfold and start clicking in, in, in better kinds of ways. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think in terms of partnering with parents, it's so critical for teachers to be setting that precedent from the very beginning. Um, I think when it comes to parent communication, it's great as an educator to be able to say, I am a very communicative teacher. I will you know, update you frequently. I welcome your feedback. I want your knowledge on your own child. Um, and again, reaffirming that you want it to be a partnership um, in support of their child for the best level of support. And so when you set that expectation from the beginning, um, it's not as jarring when you're you know, updating on challenges that a child is facing in the classroom because they're already used to that level of communication. And again, it's approached from a partnering standpoint. Um, and that can also apply to grandparents or guardians or whomever it may be. Um, I've had children in the classroom whose grandparents were very involved and almost more so than the parents themselves. And the same applied because again, that was the expectation and the agreements um, from the beginning. And so it's really critical that teachers also put in work to developing trusting relationships and positive relationships with families just as they would with children. And then you have an extended advocate too, yes. in the process, <laughs> which is always very helpful. Absolutely. So my, my next question, which I know I'm asking kind of tricky questions because you can't necessarily change people, you can't change adults as much, right? So now if, as a leader who is really hoping to make these changes um, in their centers, in their classroom, do you have any recommendations for any of the leaders we have in the audience today on how they can support staff who are potentially more resistant to making this change? You know, if, if we have um, owners or directors on here who don't have a classroom full of, full of Emily's who are ready to bring this into their learning and their curriculum. You know, that's, a, that's an important question because, you know, you can't go and um, change someone who's unwilling to change, but yet you can inform people and educate them about the importance of why this is something that needs to be part of the classroom. Um, and then learn more about what the resistance is, what the challenge is for them. And again, it's again, listening and helping them maybe learn and develop and grow in ways that they may not have been exposed to before, but with compassion and understanding um, and, and empathy as well. So, you know, it, that's very important to be able to do. Yeah, Donna took the words out of my mouth. Uh, I was going to say, 
as you know, a former program manager who was very involved in training of my teachers, it was really, really critical that our administration team and the leaders at my school really ask those open-ended questions to teachers to prompt them in self-reflecting. As I said, through my training, I you know, became able and put in the work to self-reflect and be self-aware, but not everyone has that. It's something that needs practice and again, is uncomfortable. And so as a leader from a school, you, you know, asking those open-ended questions that can really help teachers to consider these things and why they are the way that they are um, can help to, again, identify them and take steps in the right direction. So I think really the first step for leaders is to create a work environment where they're constantly pushing and guiding and prompting their teachers to self-reflect and identify areas of growth across the board and be able to come up with a plan to be able to grow and to change. Because as humans, that's our goal. We're constantly evolving. Um, and once you're able to support someone in acknowledging that, the rest kind of falls into place. And to really support growth uh, is learning information knowledge is what helps us to continue to grow. And so the more we can do that, the better we can all, all be. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much to both of you. you. That was an absolutely incredible um, presentation. I hope you've been able to see the chat a little bit because the feedback um, and absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. And um, to everyone on here, if you do have any further questions or if you want more resources, Morgan has been posting links in the chat and will continue to do so until we wrap up in about one minute. And you will also receive some resources on how to get more resources from the Houseman Institute in our show notes email. We will have all the links for you all there. Otherwise, thank you so much, Donna and Emily. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Ooh. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, to, to our audience on here, before we wrap up, I just want to send a quick reminder on a few ways you can stay in contact with us. If you do not follow us yet on Instagram, please do. And we also have a Facebook Circle Time group for early childhood educators where we're constantly sharing ideas, tips, tricks, and activities in there. It's an absolutely phenomenal community. So please go ahead and check that out. And if you don't already listen to our preschool podcast, I highly recommend you do. We have a new one um, every week. So definitely take a, keep an eye out for those. In regards to the show notes and recording, we will be sending you the show notes email with the slides from today and the recording, which I know so many of you are, will want because this is absolutely fabulous. Keep an eye out next week. Same with your certificate. Uh, do not worry if you don't see it today. Don't even worry if you don't see it tomorrow. You will absolutely receive it by next week. And again, please register for our webinar next week. Same time, same place. We will be here next Thursday, the 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we will be talking about how to level up your professional development as an early childhood educator. It is going to be amazing. I really hope to see you all there. Otherwise, thank you so much for taking the time out of your Thursday afternoon to be here and to learn together. Enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you next week.